everyone. Welcome to this episode of Mad About Markets. I'm Ritu. With me, as always, Manglam. Hi, Manglam. Hi, Ritu. What are we going to talk about today? I mean, there's so many things that we've spoken about already. <laughs> Well, you know, it is one of the largest sectors for India. Okay. It is traditional, but we don't really put the tech angle to it as much as we should. Uh, is it what I'm thinking it is? is? Is it farming? Let's let's just say. Well, it definitely is farming, but when you add tech to it, you get agri tech, <laughs> and that's what is on top of mind, and that's what we speak about today on Mad About Markets. So let's dive right in. Uh, you know, agriculture is a critical sector. We, of course, know it contributes close to 18% to the country's GDP and it employs more than half of the national workforce. So this gives you a sense of the importance of the sector and we'll tell you why this itself presents an opportunity. 45% of the workforce accounting for just 18% of the GDP and that's mm. where efficiencies are needed and that's where tech... Spot on. <laughs> and, you know, farm input and output, if you talk about the sector at large, they're huge industries in India. Agriculture inputs is essentially your seeds, fertilizers, agrochemicals or any external thing that you put in the soil which can help with the yield and the output is the essentially the crop yields. Now these two are expected to be close to 86 billion and 430 billion dollar industries by FI26. A huge contribution. I mean these are some numbers. Yes, these are some of the numbers. In fact, India has the highest dependence on agriculture if you look at any other major economy. But despite the significance of all of this that we've been talking about, it suffers from low productivity. So when we compare the output per agricultural employee in India and the cereal yield per hectare, we see that India severely lags behind countries like the US, Brazil, China uh, and others as well. So there is hope on the horizon and this is where we talk about the opportunity. All right, so that's about agri. Let's talk about tech now. Here's the agri tech. Here's where the tech comes in agri tech or agricultural technology. Simply the application of technology to produce more with less to make farming process more efficient from field to monitoring the food supply chain itself. The agri-tech explosion is not just a possibility, but it's inevitable and the need of the hour. In fact, there are a few reasons why we say that. And that's what we talk about on Mad About Markets very often. A whopping underlying agri-market of almost $500 billion. And we have the current tech penetration of only less than 1%. So, $493 billion, the underlying market size, with tech penetration sub 1% and that's where the opportunities for growth are massive. Secondly, the rapidly rising internet and smartphone penetration in India that we talk about ever so often. The penetration going beyond just the metros and that makes it ripe for tech adoption and transformation itself. And then you have the strong impetus coming in from the government with supportive policies. For instance, the government is developing an agri stack in collaboration with agri techs to make it easier to bring various stakeholders together to improve agriculture in India, to boost access to credit, crop info, also providing subsidy up to 100% to promote Kisan drones uptake by farmer. A fund for agri tech startups is also in the pipeline. And the ENAM, which is a platform that promotes better marketing opportunities for farmers to sell their produce through online competitive and transparent prices. So, I mean, it is a massive opportunity, which is just there. Yes, and uh, the government push and the various factors you outlined. Let's bring in our guest to understand if that's really played out as we think it has. Uh, welcome our guest now, Krishna Kumar, who's the co-founder and CEO at Cropin, and Shashank Kumar, the co-founder and CEO at Dehat. Gentlemen, welcome to Mad About Markets. And Krishna, I'll start with you. Uh, how big do you think the potential of the agri-tech market can be given the underpenetration of tech in the sector at the moment? I think Indian agriculture is poised to grow. Uh, if you look at uh, in, uh, in 2023, we hit the mark of 3.75 uh, trillion dollar economy, and 90% of the GDP comes from agriculture. And this deploys close to uh, you know 47 percent of the total population in the country, right? So, and and largely we depend on agriculture, right? If this improves, uh, the whole country uh, economy will also improve because the, most of the people from the bottom of the pyramid are engaged into this. So I think there is a huge potential. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, if you look at the contribution from agriculture is around $400 billion, right? And uh, just by adopting, making this whole uh, agri-tech and digital connectivity, we can you know, the additional value can be created of almost around $95 billion in this industry. And this was a report uh, 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 reported by McKinsey in one of their reports. And I think I'm, I'm very much aligned with that. And uh, we'll also see the contribution uh, which will go to the livelihood of the farmer. It will increase by 25 to 30 percent. 
Right, and Shashank, what would help in terms of policy intervention? I mean, which government policies, according to you, have moved the needle and which ones haven't? The overall, the behavioral change, uh, uh, you know, could not be ensured. I think one is the volatility, right? And, uh, right, I mean, because sometimes, uh, you know, the, the storage restriction, the export restriction, and, and we all understand because there are many external factors uh, uh, you know, policy makers, basically, they need to be cautious for. But in general, the overall, uh, you know, the volatility, uh, the two is that, you know, that uh, still the overall licensing requirement, right, I mean, towards agri value chain, I think that's highly decentralized considering agri is a state subject in India. So, for example, you require licenses for each and every district, each and every crop or the physical location where I think uh, the overall, uh, you know, the, the speed is slow. Uh, while the overall process is transparent online now, very efficient, but still it's decentralized. And basically it has to be done in a piecemeal manner. But, uh, but I think uh, the way how overall things are moving, that's very encouraging. And I would repeat, I think the way how in general the policymakers are talking about the overall digital or the data stack, I think that is going to be a game changer you know, for the entire sector because that will bring all the stakeholders at a common platform you know, to solve all the issues of Indian farmers. All right, gentlemen, hold your thoughts. It's time for us to crunch the numbers. So let's get cracking. The Agritech Gross Merchandise Value, or GMV, that is projected to experience an eight-fold growth between 2022 and 2027, going from $4 billion all the way to $34 billion. And that is the number we're going to talk about. Now, within the Agritech segment, if you break it up into various sub-segments, they also present pretty big opportunities. For instance, the food crop segment alone is expected to grow from $3 billion all the way to $25 billion by 2027. Similarly, in fiber crop, you have a $1.5 billion opportunity. Cattle and dairy, $3 billion poultry 2 billion and aquaculture another one and a half billion dollars putting together all of this that is the 34 billion dollar number that we're talking about the largest chunk of it of course coming from the food tech market so let's take a closer look at the food tech market itself uh, the opportunity like we said is 25 billion dollars but the underlying addressable market is expected to grow all the way to 341 billion dollars come 2027 and that is an opportunity you do not want to miss Incredible growth trajectory, right? I mean, I was looking at all the segments, all of them growing anywhere between six to eight times over the next five years yeah. in the GMB. But that's only about things that go into and come out of the ground. There is a big opportunity outside of that as well, beyond the core agri-tech market that we speak about. There are a lot of incremental opportunities across the value chain, which includes the likes of trading and auction platforms, which are estimated to transact over $8 billion worth of produce. And that's where a lot of inefficiencies are already. Farmgate Warehousing aims to manage more than $10 billion worth of agri-commodities. Then there is Quality Assessment, which is projected to cover a GMV of $5 billion worth of produce itself. Agri-Fintech is another one which is expected to facilitate loan disbursals worth over $3 billion. So, what does all of these uh, things that I'm talking about mean? In the next five years, the Indian agri-tech industry itself is poised for a remarkable growth. What is remarkable? 50% compounding over the next few years. That would mean 8 to 10 unicorns, 2 to 3 public listings and a positive impact. The most important one, a positive impact on 40 million plus farmers and users, which would mean that the potential increase in total farm income could surpass 100%, more than meeting the government's estimates. Well, a farm of an opportunity like you <laughs> said earlier, right? So Shashank, let me put that to you then. Uh, you know, within Agritech itself, since you're present across the spectrum, what are the fastest growing segments and the biggest opportunities that you see? I think a uh, few specific things, which is the last mile digitization piece, because still the Indian farmers and 85% of the farmers are small. Uh, they require, they need to be in the mainstream as far as their access to agri value chain services is concerned. So one is the overall last mile digitization, whether it's uh, about digital farmer advisory or the farmer financing. The two is the post-harvest value addition because every year we have 40% post-harvest loss within India. So the post-harvest value addition for the, for the better price realization for the farmer. And last not the least is in general the export considering the entire world is looking at India uh, you know, to solve the global food safety and security issue. And Krishna, what about you? I mean, how will technology drive the growth in agriculture sector? I mean, how are governments and various organizations making use of this tech? So I think uh, we are seeing a lot of uptake, not only in India, but globally, uh, not only in private sector, but also with the uh, implementation uh, uh, organizations like 
uh, developer agencies and the governments who are coming forward and taking this uh, solution. To give you an example, because of this Ukraine war, there is a shortage of wheat and the uh, prices has gone high. And we, we have been engaged with the Nigeria government to predict wheat in their country much in advance. So they take, take, they take a decision how much to import basis what is happening in the country. Right? The other example could be basis this kind of intelligence. Can I take a decision of how much uh, fertilizer to be imported per county based on the you know how the farmers are taking the crops in that county right and and this is all driven by the disruption of the supply chain because the prices has gone high and you need to be very optimal uh, in making your decisions so i think you know technology is definitely is going to be forefront and uh, and uh, you see the much bigger growth uh, driven by this be prepared for a lot of tech jargon because now we're going to talk about how agri-tech players are actually transforming the way agriculture is traditionally being done across all stages of the value chain in agriculture. I mean, for instance, data analytics and machine learning play a crucial role in improving productivity. Then there are platforms and data-driven solutions for price discovery, price transparency that empower farmers by providing access to real-time information on both input and output prices. You have imaging and how can AI technology stay far behind? They are actually utilized to monitor crop quality, allowing for automation in grading output and yield classification itself. There are platforms for produce traceability that enhance visibility and transparency across the supply chain. We have robotics and drones. They've emerged as valuable tools in agriculture as well. And farming as a service, FAAS, can optimize equipment utilization and reduce idle time. So much efficiency makes our food quicker, faster, cheaper and makes the farmer richer. It does and so much technology and the amount of money that is chasing it. Let's talk about that because funding in this agri-tech sector has been on an impressive growth trajectory and that is reflecting in the increased amount of interest and confidence in the industry. So from $187 billion in 2018, you've seen funding go up all the way to $1.2 billion as of 2021. Then, of course, we know there was a funding winter and funding came down to about $1.1 billion. And as of the first six months of this year, we've seen about $161 billion flowing across various deals that have happened despite the macro headwinds. In fact, agri-tech was one of the better performing sectors when you look at the startup ecosystem overall in terms of funding. Well, we spoke about a lot of funding, we spoke about a lot of technology. So let's ask, what are the key areas in which tech is changing the way agri is done? Krishna, could you explain with an example of how Cropin is partnering with the government in the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana? If I take an example of working with the you know, government in terms of uh, Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana, the biggest challenge was you know, to underwrite this risk, right? How do you make this payment faster when the crop you know, the farmer crops is, uh, is, uh, has failed. It used to take two to three years to establish that, right? And by the then, farmer, <coughs> farmer needed that money much earlier than that. Now, government wanted to infuse this technology to monitor this re remotely using, you know, satellite technology that can you, can we model this yield prediction and the crop health and the estimation of the acreages on those crops in that uh, insurance unit? And, uh, and that can help us to take a faster decision and then you know, farmer can see the payouts much faster if the crop fails in that, in that direction. It also reduced the cost of, cost of what government is spending to do the crop cutting experiment to establish these yields. So you know, in, a, in a crop season, of, uh, when the harvest comes, there, you know, uh, uh, it's a two-month uh, two month window to establish the crop cutting experiments. And we almost do 10 million such crop cut uh, across the country. It's a huge cost. So every crop cut will cost you, let's say, 1,000 to 1,500 rupees, right? And multiply that by 10 million of uh, those crop cuts, which has to done across the country to establish the yield and then the payouts to happen. And then there are their own nuances of wrong data, you know, influence data, which was, was interfering with the payouts happening to those growers and taking a lot of time. But with the implementation of technology, you know, you are bringing down the cost by more than 40 to 50 percent in the phase one. And then also accelerating the pace of making this payment faster to the grower when the crop fails. Right. So these are some of the value you can extract from technology and the scale and, and the, you know, uh, the fast pace uh, solutioning you can bring uh, to the table. Well, it is all pervasive indeed. But Shashank, when you try to reinvent a sector like agriculture, especially as large as the one that we have, it's a huge task because there are so many stakeholders. So it's not just a matter of tech. 
it is also a matter of influencing behavior change. Has that happened over the last few years? Slightly early as a green shoot, but I think that is something which is definitely a point of inflection. The, I think in last two, three years, different stakeholders have realized their respective expertise. So it's not like that, you know, that any single organization or institution, whether it's government or private player, and within private player, whether a large conglomerate or a startup can solve the entire problem standalone. So I think last few years, people have realized their core expertise. And now people are making up their mind to focus on their ex uh, expertise and at the same time being collaborative with other complementary skill sets. So, and that's where I think most of the agri-tech startups working, which is more towards the last mile, which is more towards the behavioral change of various stakeholders, whether it's farmers or middlemen or the, or the SMEs. And that's where I think the agri-tech has a, has, a, has, a, has a lot to you know, contribute and, and, a, and a very important role to play. All right, we have lots more to talk about, but we have to take a short break. So hold your thoughts there, because we're going to return with what works, what doesn't work, the yays and the mays. And of course, as always, the bigger question, will Agritech transform India into a farming powerhouse? More on that after a short break. Software presents C 